Cinematograph films taken on raids over enemy territory can give a vivid impression of the country below. But when the RAF wish to assess the damage done by bombs, planes are sent over at a far greater height to take series of photographs covering wide areas. These photographs do not always convey very much to the untrained eye. What is it that enables the expert to interpret them so accurately? The answer is a simple one. Stereoscopy. Fifty years ago, the stereoscope was popular in the form of a hand instrument with two lenses and a rack at the back into which were slipped pairs of photographs. The stereoscope used by photographic interpreters works on the same principle in a new form. The principle employs a visual trick whereby two flat objects seen with each eye separately converge, giving an illusion of depth. The same applies if you take two cubes as an example, or two buildings from two separate still photographs. Each still taken by the camera should overlap the previous still by at least 60%. The interpreter can then view any point of a photographed area. Naturally, experience is needed in addition to a stereoscope. Interpreters engaged on this work are highly trained. They report what they see in the quickest possible time, but never allow themselves to sacrifice accuracy for speed. Here, a reconnaissance plane having brought back photographs of Mainz, an interpreter is at work assessing the damage caused by the last raid. At his left are photographs of the same area taken before the raid, which allow him to make a comparison. And he also refers to a master mosaic. The mosaic is really a completed photographic jigsaw of the whole area. On it is recorded all damage inflicted on the enemy target area up to date. He can distinguish between new damage and old by a quick reference to this mosaic. New damage is marked up with a China Graph pencil. From an ordinary map of the town, the precise position of a damaged chemical factory is determined and a note made for his report. Let's see just what happened to Mainz. Here, enclosed by the white line, is a piece of typical devastation. The damage shows up so clearly that even the naked eye can see some of it. It's nearly a mile and three quarters long and varies in width from 95 to 240 yards. The interpreter estimates that it consists of approximately 55 acres, utterly devastated, mostly by fire. But that's only a part of the total damage to be found in the city. In all, 135 acres have been destroyed. Compare the area outside the original white line with the damage within. In the undamaged parts on the right, roofs and entire houses are intact. But in the left half circle, roofs are missing and nothing remains but charred and jagged walls. Through the remains of windows in these walls, the sun is shining, throwing a spotted pattern on the streets. The fire damage is so great that it is hard at first to pick out high explosive damage. But look closer for one moment. Here is some typical HE damage. Notice the characteristic white splashes. That big patch of white is where a 4,000 pounder landed. It used to be a large block of offices and shops. And here is the mark of another 4,000 pounder, this time in Dusseldorf main railway station. Compare it with a photograph of the building before the attack. That hole in the roof measures nearly 300 feet across. A photograph cannot show the havoc underneath, but you can see how wide the blast area from a 4,000 pounder is from, for instance, the next one in Lübeck. Eight to ten houses completely destroyed and about 45 others very badly damaged. The area of complete destruction covers about one acre. And here's another point of interest illustrated by the damage done in Lübeck. Types of structures vary with towns, so different towns produce different types of damage. The Baltic supply port of Lübeck is a congested town of old high storied buildings with wooden staircases. For that reason, fire spreads easily and causes enormous areas of devastation, 200 acres in this case. Compare the result of the Thousand Bomber raid on Cologne. You can recognize Cologne by its cathedral. 
The railway station was not hit on this raid, but it has been damaged and repaired more than once. In Cologne, because of the numbers of modern stone and concrete structures, individual areas of devastation are not as great as at Lübeck. But the total damage inflicted was far greater, over 600 acres, divided among smaller groups and including 250 factory buildings. As the camera travels over the city, we can pick out a few of the worst areas for you but the havoc is so widespread and extensive that you would have to study this photograph for days to find out the full extent of the damage. The honeycombed effect, like a series of tiny cardboard boxes, comes from hundreds of buildings in the business and administrative heart of the city completely gutted by fire, as in Lübeck. But where stone and concrete predominate, fire is less effective than HE. These buildings are badly damaged, but not completely gutted. Cologne, as a centre both of production and of communications, is a vital point. That's why Bomber Command concentrates on this enemy stronghold. The method of total bombing was, of course, initiated by the Nazis. They are now feeling the weight of their own weapon. The population can only escape the RAF if they leave the factories and go out into the fields. Here's an instructive picture of damage to a factory, the famous Heinkel bomber works at Rostock. A stick of high explosive has been accurately dropped across the main assembly shed. Fuselages and part-finished aircraft have been dragged out of the wrecked shop as salvage. Another shed, the prototype final assembly shop, has been severely damaged. Notice how white the roof is from the blast of the bombs which made these craters alongside. Other parts of the works have been burnt out by incendiaries, and the final casualty is the Gestapo headquarters, entirely gutted. The supply base of Rostock was attacked consecutively for four nights. The pall of smoke that drifted across the city in the earlier photographs hindered the work of interpretation, one of the many difficulties met by interpreters. But as the smoke cleared away and later photographs came in, the havoc caused by the fire became visible, and havoc it certainly is, a concentrated area of 130 acres in the city and docks. These pictures of damage may seem confusing because they were photographed from a great height. But this, incidentally one of the most remarkable reconnaissance pictures ever taken, is what serious industrial damage looks like from a height of only 300 feet. This picture clearly shows damage even to the untrained eye. But the practical method of carrying out photographic reconnaissance of air raid damage is from the higher altitudes. This shattered factory was the famous Renault works in Paris, which was turning out large numbers of tanks and lorries for the Germans. Here is a photograph of the vital naval dockyard at Wilhelmshaven, before the raid. These sheds stored shells and small arms ammunition. A stick of bombs fell right across the dump and caused an enormous explosion an example of both direct and indirect damage. The explosions, first of the bombs, then of the ammunition, shattered every building over the enormous area of 120 acres. Docks and shipyards are particularly important targets, more especially when they're being used as supply bases to foreign fronts. A before the raid picture of the Ansaldo fitting out yard at Genoa, on the right, shows what happened later. The result is not as clear to the naked eye as at the Renault works, but the interpreter, with his stereoscope, learns that practically all the sheds have been completely destroyed, and that the main area of devastation covers nine acres. Even picture postcards help an interpreter. For example, the three buildings in an arc on the aerial photograph are the buildings on the postcard of the Piazza Corvetto in Genoa. The aerial photograph shows that the upper stories of the three buildings are gutted by fire.
In Lübeck and Cologne, the difference in buildings, materials and structure made a lot of difference to the damage done. In Genoa, the buildings are mainly of stone, with very little timber. Naturally, they stand up better to fire. But notice the large numbers of roofless buildings in the city, which show what incendiaries can do, even to buildings of this kind. Here are some of these same buildings on the famous film taken during the raid on Genoa. Films of this sort are being used for experimental purposes, to find out whether cinematography can be an additional aid to the interpreter. It is already of help in giving a general impression of the success of the raid. In the slowed-up film, bombs falling are clearly seen by the light of the flares, those round blobs dotted about in the picture. Right at the end of this film, you will see incendiaries falling on the left in the Via Palestro. And one thing which may be learned from these pictures is the time taken by an incendiary to penetrate a roof. We do not yet know all the ways in which this film, or others like it, may prove of value to the interpreter. But there is no doubt that the work of interpretation will grow as the damage mounts, and our attacks on the enemy increase in frequency and intensity.